What is up, guys? Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Bleeding BNG podcast, episode 75. So before we get any further, um, I just mentioned that this is episode 75. So this is kind of like a milestone episode for um, for your boy over here at Bleeding BNG. So I just want to take the time out to thank you guys for who have been rocking with us. Um, we're almost at our two-year anniversary point, and to see us... Um, or to see the progress that we've made on this channel um, with this podcast and things like that, some of the connections that we've made with the Washington football team um, or with the Washington Commanders. When I started this podcast in um, 2021, at the beginning of 2021, I just started this podcast um, because I wanted to build something that I was passionate about, um, something that uh, could potentially open up new avenues for me to get more access to the team. And both of those goals have been accomplished. So like I've said before, I appreciate you guys for all the support. Um, as always, if you're checking this out on YouTube, be sure to like, be sure to comment, be sure to subscribe. Um, and if you're checking this out on podcast-only platforms, specifically on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please, please leave a rating, please leave a, um, please leave a review. Um, because that's uh, finesse these algorithms so that when Bleeding BNG, when you're looking for anything Washington Commanders, Bleeding BNG is the number one content hub um, that pop ups on your algorithm. So those are the ways that we finesse those algorithms as well. Um, now back to here. Here's let's get to what we all came here for. Um, in a game that was deemed the biggest game of the year, in a game that was deemed the biggest game since 2016, in a game that was deemed one of the most electrifying or one of the most high state games that FedEx Field has ever seen, the Washington Commanders. Lose to the New York Giants 12 to 20. The Washington Commanders lose to the New York Giants 12 to 20. And to give you a timestamp like I do for every episode, it's about 6.45 on Monday, December 19th. So we're about 22 hours um, after the game had kicked off. Um, and like I've always said, guys, I just needed some time. I just needed to, some time to simmer down. But also, you know. With the late game, it kind of threw off our regular schedule. As you know, the Washington Commanders are used to playing in a well, 1 p.m. game. It's almost like we were submitted in that slot. Um, so it was becoming natural for me to like report a podcast later that evening, um, Sunday evening and things like that. And then to have it out to you guys by Monday morning. But with the Sunday night game, you know, I had to go to work at 8 o'clock this morning. Still had to pay the bills. Had to keep the main thing the main thing. But um, I do want to give you guys some instant um, reaction and some instant analysis. It's only we know how at the Bleeding BNG podcast. Like I said before, we give you the most raw, the most uncut, and the most unfiltered analysis through, throughout the land. Throughout the land, whether that be on Twitter, YouTube, social media, whatever platform you're looking for. We're going to give you the most raw, uncut, and unfiltered analysis for the um, Washington Commanders. So if that's what you're looking for, you don't found the right place. So let's get started. I'm going to actually call this episode Paddle Boats and Zebras. Paddle Boats and Zebras. Um, and the reason why I titled it that is because that was the theme of the game. To me, that was the theme of the game. You guys know, um, or a lot of you guys that have been following us for a while, uh, one of our signature moments this season um, was after our Tennessee Titan game when I called Ron Rivera Paddle Boat Ron. When I call Ron, Paddle Boat Ron, I still hear from some of you guys um, today, even going through the stadium and things like that. Like, man, that was one of your best episodes. Like, you was in your bag that day. And guess what? Ron had kind of deviated from his Paddle Boat ways during his win streak and things like that. But the Paddle Boat was back yesterday. And it's not just Ron. It's not just Ron, but it's his coaching staff as well. But when you have this coach-centric approach that has the head coach run everything, Everything's going to fall in line on the, on the um, everything's going to fall in line on the head coach. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, this was deemed as what the biggest game of the of the year in the entire NFL. This game had the biggest odds on the um, on any regular season game so far in the entire NFL this season, right? And you knew this. If you listen to my voice, I'm, I, I lost my voice. I'm just recovering now. That's part of one of the reasons I didn't do a podcast last night as well. You guys would have been hearing a lot of <laughs> nothing. You guys would have been hearing a lot of nothing. So I, I, I bought my energy because, you know, we always boost on the ground at the stadium. I bought my energy. And my thing is, no matter the regime, no matter the coaching staff, we always come out flat in these big games. Whether it be Jim Zorn, Jay Gruden, whoever you want to name. Whoever you want to name. In the Dan Snyder era. 
we always seem to start flat in these big games. Now, sometimes we may be able to turn it around and things like that, have a comeback miracle victory and things like that. Um, that's where a lot of our moments, as you know, these new age Washington Redskins commander football team fans who haven't seen Super Bowls, we remember a lot of the comebacks like the Monday Night Miracle and things like that. But another underlying thing or another constant thing that goes on throughout this franchise and this organization is that we always find a way to come out flat in big games. Yesterday was no different. Whether that be Deshaun Jackson torching us and going up top on LeRon Landry on the first play. Or Kayvon Thibodeau establishing dominance from quarter one with a strip sack against Taylor Heineke. We always seem to start throwing these games. And that's, that's going to fall back on the head coach. Like I said, I, I do believe that this is an organizational issue. But hey, I'm going I'm to put it with this coach-centric approach. That falls in line on the head coach. You've been preparing for this team for three weeks. Yes, I said three weeks. You had two weeks with the bye week. But you also prepared for this team because this is the team that you played right before the bye as well. You've been preparing for this team for three weeks. And it did not look like it. It did not look like it on either side of the ball. I know one of the myths, and I think that it's true for most organizations, is that, you know, most offensive coordinators or most head coaches script their first 15 plays. It does not look like it with us. It looked like that boy Scott Turner be out there just going with the flow. And his flow is off. His flow is off. His mojo is horrible right now. As I told you in our last episode, after we recapped the tie against the New York Giants, we have to coach to win the game. We have to coach to win the game. And Ron Rivera did the exact opposite of that yesterday. And Brian Dayball did that. And that's why, guess what? In result, they won the game. Example. Fourth and two on the 51-yard line. You got Joey Slot, who's known to have one of the strongest legs in the NFL. He may not be the most accurate. But you talk about NFL circles, Joey Sly is one of the strongest legs. He proved it with his multiple 50-yard field goal performance against the Philadelphia Eagles. In one of the last big games that we played. Or our last big game that we played. So like I said. Fourth and two on the 34 yard line. That would have been a 51 yard kick. Which is like a chip shot in today's NFL if we're being honest. Almost every kicker is expected to make at least 50 yard kicks at this point. But instead you being scared. You're going back to your paddle boatish ways. You sent Tress Way out there to punt the ball and they return it to the 30. So because you want to be conservative and scared, you had a net of four yards on that play and change of field position. Instead of even attempting, instead of even attempting to kick the field goal. Worst case scenario, you miss a field goal. That ball is what? Spotted at the 44? That's a 14-yard difference. Excuse me. That's a 14-yard difference. You coach to win the game. You coach to win the game. Let's get to this offensive performance, man. Taylor Heineke, 17 for 29, 249 yards, and one touchdown. As it is, or as it seemed recently for Taylor Heineke, when you read the the entire totality of that stat line, it doesn't come off or read off as bad as he played. Now, I don't think that he played horrible. But if you read a stat like 249 yards, I swear 220 of those came in the second half. Because you start out flat. As I mentioned last week, everybody that wants to... Everybody that's an advocate for Taylor Heineke, everybody that wants to put Taylor Heineke on this pedestal wants to talk about his late game magic. But they always want to ignore (coughs) his early game faults and his early game flaws that results in him having to pull out a fucking bunny out his ass in in the last couple of minutes. 
And the magic ain't been magic in the last couple of weeks, if we being honest. I ain't seen the bunny since. I ain't seen the bunny since what? Atlanta. The magic is wearing off on Taylor Heineke. Like I said, he just came out flat, missing throws in the first half, selling balls. We couldn't get a drive going because we can't convert on third down. That's something that he was doing extremely well at the beginning of our win streak. What happened? What happened? And it's frustrating to see. It's frustrating to see, to say the least. Because as I told you before the before the um, win streak or um, yeah, our little win streak that we were having and things like that, we didn't have an identity, and it seemed like we found it, but now it's like we deviate in a way back away from it. So what are we now? In the most crunch time of the season, we're getting away from our identity. And if this next stat that I read doesn't prove that to you, I don't know what will. Brian Robinson, 12 carries for 89 yards. The 89 yard part isn't an issue. This man averaged 7 yards per carry. Why the hell is he only having 12 carries and 4 in the second half? I'll be the first to say it. Brian Robinson only getting four carries in the second half while averaging seven yards per carry is coaching malpractice. It's coaching malpractice. This is the type of stuff coaches get fired for. Especially in situations when you're playing in the biggest game of the year, quote unquote. These are the th- type of coaching malpractice that get spotlighted when you play on Sunday night football. You wanted the national spotlight? Well, well, you got it. Well, you got it. And whether it be the Dallas game last year, whether it be the 2013 season, whether it be the 2006 season, There's a constant thing for this team. You can never get too high on this team. Because when you do, they're bound to let you down. You can never get too high on this team. Because when you do, they're going to knock you down. Now you're crashing, burning, and falling. It never fails. It never fails. Death taxes and the Washington organization letting you down. Brian Robinson over there dragging dudes. Literally putting 379 pound Dexter Lawrence on his back and dragging dudes. Consistently, constantly moving the pile. And it's almost like Scott Turner forgot that he was on his team yesterday. Not only that, I told y'all that Scott asked Madden Turner. And for my my fans that and for my fans and my listeners that don't play Madden. Ask Madden is a feature where you just click the button and they literally tell you what play to run. That's what Scott be doing on the sidelines. Oh, I'm sorry. He's in the booth now. The shit doesn't seem to be helping anyway. Because he just, every time outside of the Philadelphia Eagle game, he seems to want to deviate from what's working just so he can show off what he put in his playbook this week. It's the most annoying shit ever. It's the most annoying shit ever. Let's look at some of these receiver stat lines. Jahan Dyson, four receptions, 105 yards, and a touchdown. Jahan Dyson played his ass off yesterday. Jahan Dyson showed up in prime time. But guess what? Jahan Dyson could have been doing this. It's almost like Scott realized that he was on his team yesterday. Now, I know he's been hurt. But John Dodson should never leave a game getting one or two targets like he was doing his first couple of games back. Because that talent that he put on 
He, he, he exuded yesterday, that talent he exhibited yesterday. He's capable of doing that every week. Get him the ball. Let's keep going down these receiver stat lines. Terry McLaurin, six receptions for 70 yards. Terry McLaurin caught all of his targets. So you know what's the issue with that? Why is Terry McLaurin only getting six targets? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Why is Terry McLaurin only getting six targets? That's a foundational issue. Some more coaching malpractice. Terry McLaurin had Fabian Moreau traveling him with him all game. The New York Giants treated Fabian Moreau like he was a fucking star yesterday against Terry McLaurin. Treated him like he was Darrell Revis in his prime. Fabian Moreau followed Terry McLaurin everywhere yesterday like he nice. Like he's nice. But guess what? Scott Turner got him looking nice. I tweeted out early in the game. Early in the game. After, if not the first series, the second. I said, Fabian Moreau is playing 900 yards off Terry McLaurin. Throw the goddamn slant. Why are we waiting to throw any type of short pass to Terry McLaurin until the beginning of the third quarter? Because when Scott asked Matt, and that's not what they told him to do. That's exactly why. Scott asked Matt and Turner. I'm sick of it. You cannot go 1-3-1 one, and one in your division and expect to make the playoffs. That's why my expectations were from here yesterday to here. I do not expect to make the playoffs. I don't care what the odds look like. I don't care that we're the seventh seed right now. And if you grew up in a legit Washington commander, Redskins football team organization fan, you shouldn't either because you know what we do during these times. We were about to make the playoffs last year. Then what happened? COVID. Dallas putting 60 points on our head. We were about to make the playoffs in 2016. Then what happened? Ass whooping by the Panthers. Ass whooping by the Giants. We were about to make the playoffs in 2018. Then what happened? Lose three of our last four. So all the people telling me that yesterday was no big deal, because I have heard that throughout the community, because we're still in the playoff hunt. Man, stop. Stop it. I really don't want to hear that. Because that's what y'all are used to now, conforming to be a chaser. This franchise, this team, this organization has had you content with being a chaser. I want to be a leader. When are we going to be the initiators? When were you going to take control of our own destiny? Guess what? It could have been yesterday with you winning that game, but you didn't. But you didn't. Just to highlight some other offensive performances, I'm letting you know now, Logan Thomas is fucking cooked. Logan Thomas is cooked. One reception for six yards. Me personally, I believe one of the biggest plays in the game was that Logan Thomas drop pass on what? It was either first, I think it was first down. Right after the long um, catch to Johan Dotson, the long 60-yard reception to Johan Dotson. Taylor hits Logan in the hands on the out route. He just outright jumps the ball. Well, guess what? Now you're playing behind the sticks, which we can't do with noodle ass arm Taylor Heineke. But I'm not even blaming him for that because that was a good throw. Logan Thomas' cooked ass has to make that catch. <laughs> Logan Thomas reached his peak in 2020, and he will never reach that peak again. He's on the wrong side of 30. That ACL injury didn't do him any favors. And he's looking cooked. This is the second bad game in a row that Logan Thomas has played. And I'm starting to question, is he even the best tight end in that room right now? Because Cole Turner, baby. He made some plays in the run game. I thought y'all told me Cole Turner couldn't block. We'll touch on that in another episode. Because Cole Turner made some plays in the run game. For sure. And the last offensive performance I wanted to touch on. Man, look me in my eyes when I say this. Look me in the eyes when I say this. 
I'm going to need everybody in the Washington football community. And it's not just the fans. Because I'm starting to see it with the organization too. I'm going to need everybody in the Washington commander community to stop treating Charles Leno like he's prime Trent Williams. Because he is fucking mid. I know he's a nice guy. I know his family chops it up with you guys over on Twitter. But that's one thing that we've seen as Washington Redskins fans. I'm going to just leave it with the Redskins right now. Joe Jacoby, Chris Samuel, Trent Williams. We know what good left tackle play is. And y'all be giving this dude, Charles Leno, a fucking pass every week. Charles Leno got his ass whooped for four quarters by Kayvon Thibodeau yesterday. Charles Leno is not that fucking good. Charles Leno in the last couple of games has shown you every reason why the Chicago Bears got rid of his ass. Because I think that's we seem to forget that. Charles Leno was released. And we come here and give him a contract extension. I don't give a damn about a Walter Payton man of the year. Block some goddamn body. Please. Please. I don't even put that first fumble on Taylor Heineke because Kayvon Thibodeau got back that bitch in 1.3 seconds. Jesus Christ himself was fumbling that football. Thanks to Charles Leno. Now let's go to this defense. When I look at the big picture of the defense, defense only allowed 13 points. Check. The defense held Daniel Jones to about 170 yards. Check. So we should have won the game. Now a lot of that has to do with the offense. And their inability to move the ball or put up points. Their inability to look like a functional NFL caliber offense. Let's just call it what it is. A lot of that goes to them. But there were moments in the game where the defense didn't. Didn't look like the championship defense that they've been looking like throughout the months of November and December. Or late October and November. I guess we haven't played much in December to this point. Going back to coaching to win the game. Brian Dayball went for it on fourth and nine. Got that bitch. Made it look easy too. Didn't think twice about it. Called a timeout. Let you see what he was doing and did it again. First down. Like it was nothing. Coaching to win the game. And like I said, the defense didn't play bad, but it comes to moments. That's one of the moments. On that drive, you got picked apart because you playing soft ass cover two defense. And I promise you now. I noticed this in the Philly game, and I said during that. Now, we all had good vibes because that was a great win and things like that, but I said during that game because Bobby McCain got cooked by Dallas Goddard in man coverage. I said, I wonder who else is going to pick up on this. You know, the vibes were great because we beat the Philadelphia Eagles, but you know me being the football head that I am. I said, I wonder which team is going to pick up on this. Ever since we've moved Bobby McCain to the slot, We've been playing almost exclusively zone. Because he's incapable of checking premier slot receivers in the slot, which I understand. But that limits what you do offensively, and Brian Dayball knew that yesterday. In the first half, we had Daniel Jones looking like prime Joe Montana, just picking his own apart. Just the receiver standing at the line of scrimmage, picking his own apart. But you're incapable of playing man because you have a safety playing the slot corner. And I lied to you now. I said during that Philadelphia Eagle game, I wonder who's going to be the first team to pick this up and pick this apart. The Giants did in the first half yesterday. It's a roster issue. 
We don't have a legit slot corner on the roster. Now, while it may help you in the run game, I think Bobby McCain had double-digit tackles yesterday. Bobby McCain didn't play a horrible game, but they did pick on Bobby McCain in coverage. They attacked his own nearly every time. And that's his own coverage. So imagine what he would have did in man. The D-line, man. Anybody listening to this podcast right now got about the same amount of pressure the defensive line got on Daniel Jones all night yesterday. John Allen, this is what you gave away free tickets for, bro? Stop telling me how you run to see everybody out in big games when you don't show up your damn self. And I love John Allen. John Allen and Deron Payne didn't play their best football games yesterday when we needed it. When we needed it. Like I said, defense played okay, but the Giants had their moments. How about in the, on, um, in the fourth quarter? Saquon, three back-to-back-to-back first down rushes of 10, 12, and 15 yards. Gashing us. Gashing us. Resulting in the field goal to put them back up eight. Now you need another touchdown and a two-point conversion. But I ain't going to stick on the, on the defense because I need to get to these damn refs before we get out of here. I told you I won't keep you that long. Title of this episode is Paddle Boats and Zebras. I'm never the type to put too much on the referees, but the referees fucking cost us that game yesterday. When you have two on the line, game on the line type calls, like the illegal motion or the illegal formation that they called against Terry McLaurin or something that didn't even affect the play. Oh, you know John Mary made that call to the referees in the NFL offices yesterday. We were never winning that game. The NFL wanted New York to win that game yesterday. Then you couple that with Curtis Samuel getting goddamn bear hugged in the back of the end zone, but everybody telling me that's a judgment call. Well, buddy, your fucking judgment is off. Maybe you shouldn't be a ref if your judgment is that fucking far off. Because I can see from the opposite end zone that he was being held prior to the ball getting there. To go along with a number of other bad calls. That offensive P.I. was fucking bullshit. That offensive P.I. was bullshit. And even if you want to say he extended his hands and want to be, what, the letter of the law, going with the book and things like that, guess what? I see the Packers run it every week. I see the Chiefs run it every week. I see the Rams run it every week. And they never get called for that shit. It's almost like the NFL is beefing with our owner. It's almost like they've been beefing with our owner for the last 20 years. That's why none of these calls that these referees make come as a surprise to me. Because I'm used to them by now. But if you have any type of objective bone in your body. You know the commanders got cheated out those last couple of calls last today. Let's be real. So that'll do it for this episode of the Bleeding B&G Podcast, man. We got three more games. Three more games. And we got to fly out to them big, bass, big bad San Francisco 49ers on a short week on Christmas Eve. These boys bad not ruin my Christmas. These boys bad not ruin my Christmas. Seeing my team get spanked. Imagine seeing your team get their ass whipped and then you got to wake up and give out gifts the next morning. That's going to be hard for me. I don't know about you, but that's going to be hard for me. But that'll do it for this episode of the Bleeding BNG Podcast, man. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully we can turn these things around, man, and get back on the winning trail. Um, because I would love, I would love to do our first ever Bleed and BNG playoff recap episode. I would love to have to do our first ever Bleed and BNG playoff recap episode. So as I said before, man, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Be sure to check us out on our social media pages. Our Instagram is at Bleed and BNG, B-L-E-E-D-I-N-G. B and G. Our Twitter handle is spelled a tad bit different. That one is at Bleeding B and G. B L E E D I N B and G. So there's only one G in our Twitter handle. If you're listening to this podcast only, but specifically on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, 
Let's finesse these algorithms. Leave a rating. Leave a review. Hopefully five stars. Hopefully you guys keep rocking with us over at Bleeding BNG. And I'll check in on you guys later.